Hello folks, hope you're all doing good. The last time we met, virtually of course, we discussed uh, certain aspects about the structure of the atom, an electron, and various physical aspects of uh, some landmark experiments and what we learned from them. This session, we will continue to understand about certain aspects that we all very we all know well about for instance conduction in the in the metal and how the electrons travel and why do they behave with certain uh, qualities for instance we all know about the most famous uh, law which controls the current conduction in conductors right so basically we call it the ohms law which tells you that the current that goes through uh, a metallic conductor has a direct relationship with the potential applied and there is uh, a proportionality constant right we call the conductivity sigma so this is this was an experimental fact and it was found to match with most of the measurements that have been conducted at the time and there was no scientific backing behind this so we will proceed to see the first scientific explanation for this particular law which was given by a person called Paul Drude the big mushed man here in 1900 right he was more concerned with a more peculiar aspect of uh, conduction in uh, in metals basically it was current conductivity the ratio of current conductivity versus the electrical conductivity this was called the wiedermann frege's law and it states that the ratio of thermal conductivity to the electrical conductivity of several materials metals seems to follow this particular relationship that is this ratio which was called as the Lorentz number was almost constant for most metals so he was obsessed with explaining why this is the case and and he explained this using a very simple model based on ideal gases which was very popular in that time right so let us go into understanding this particular law uh, or this particular uh, treatise by drude and to see how he came up with explaining the ohm's law and so forth if time permits we will proceed to to see some uh, some very interesting results from the drude's law about hall effect and so on and so forth right so let us go on so now let us discuss the drude's model for electronic conduction in metals so he addressed this drude's model okay he, he addressed this using the uh, previously well understood kinetic theory of gases so he made some basic assumptions quite in line with the, the previous understanding of uh, atoms in gases right? so he considered that the electrons in metals are almost free quite as uh, gas atoms in an inert gas right we all know what an inert gas is from the kinetic theory of gases that we have previously seen but the second assumption was that the electrons do not interact with each other so there are he did not think about electrons uh, scattering or bouncing off each other he thought that the electrons get scattered by the positive course positive ion course we know that there exists a positive ion code in an atom and so forth they get scattered by positive ion course right the the velocities velocity change and collision are instantaneous in the sense that they travel in straight line without being affected by each other and suddenly 
there is a collision and the velocity and everything gets changed instantaneously right so these are the assumptions they are very very crude assumptions very basic assumptions but let us see where this leads to right so before we proceed we have to understand or we have to have a feel for how many uh, electrons are there per unit uh, let's say volume of centimeters cube right so basically we define a number called n which is the number of electrons per centimeter cube right? this is called electronic density so how do we calculate this so there was an idea of mole right mole a, a mole one mole of a metal had an avogadro number of atoms right this is a b and an avogadro number of each of the atom has what is called as a valence electron z so the valence electron is the number of electrons that that particular atom have for some chemical reactions right all these things the valence comes from chemical reaction the idea of a field band and stuff which we have previously seen right and once we have this we know the molar volume so what's the molar volume so the density is mass per volume right so the atomic weight by volume so which gives your volume is weight per rho so basically our number n is the avogadro number into z right by weight into rho so this is the number of uh, free electrons that the metal have for conduction now let us consider that and there is a metal piece like this and it has lot of electrons with an uniform density right of n that is already given right now when there is no external bias right each of these atoms are moving in random velocity and what gives this random velocity anybody has an idea or do you think that the 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 electrons in an atom are stationary so the answer for this is given by the kinetic theory right the kinetic theory gives you or says from the equipartition theorem that each system each part each part of your system have an energy of 3 by 2 kbt right each degree of freedom in your system has 3 by 2 kbt so kb being the boltzmann constant t being the temperature this is your energy and this will be equivalent to your kinetic energy so each electron is moving with a velocity proportional to this number right given by this particular equation but then the velocities are not coherent so they are in all particular directions therefore the net motion of uh, of electrons is zero so the so this gives you an important thing at at no external bias net electronic displacement displacement is zero right with that given let us assume that there exists that we apply a, a particular potential right so here we are trying to see what happens how the conduction happens in metals so we apply a potential right so we take something similar as we saw before we have lot of uh, electrons going in all sort of random directions and i apply an electric field right such that i have negative potential here and positive potentials here so what happens is now these electrons start to move towards it because they are being repelled by this one and attracted by the positive one right so when i have this particular situation what's the force acting on each of these electron let's say i apply an electric field e the force on an electron 
is minus E E right on the electrostatic principles that we have previously seen so this is the force on each of the electron and what does this force do force accelerates charge right so basically this should lead to a change in momentum so px is the momentum and i am talking about only let us say uh, one dimensional uh, case here so i have an electric field along x axis so this particular electric field along x axis applies a force once again along x axis causing a change in the uh, the electronic momentum right if this is the only thing that is acting on the charge carriers in the metal the electron should continually accelerate the velocity should continually change if there exists a non existing non zero force and it has to have a current which is increasing in time but that's not what the ohms law says right so basically the electrons do not uh, accelerate continually and they attain a constant velocity for any applied potential how do we know this it's not then uh, just like that uh, uh, assumption taken off hand right this is true because for any applied potential there is a constant current so the electron is assumed to attain a constant velocity so how is it possible so the drood has takes this kind of an assumption right this is again an assumption by drood without a large of uh, without very big physical intuition he says that let us say there are n electrons right capital n here n electrons which were accelerated at time t equal to 0 he says that this n electron which were not impacted by any collision has this particular temporal dependence where this n so basically this is a differential equation right which tells you that the number of electrons which were not affected by any collision reduces in this particular fashion and this tau he called as the relaxation time so this is the rate at which the electrons which did not get scattered gets reduced by time or you can say that this is the scattering rate or the relaxation time right so once you know that this particular uh relationship exists then you can also uh give a similar relationship for the uh for the momentum so basically he says the momentum change also reduces in the same way because the 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 electrons which are being accelerated by the force get scattered and hence because that particular number drops the eventual momentum also drops right so the total force that is acting because of this is so basically the the total okay so basically we have an force which is acting due to uh, the electric field and there is a force due to this scattering and this has to be zero because at steady state the velocity is constant or dp by dx is zero right
now once this is given we can actually calculate the average velocity of these things right so because we know what some momentum is so we know e e is equal to minus m v x by tau so where i have taken this v x is the average velocity right because you have several such electrons and all of them get scattered in very different rates and we know that this tau is just an average quantity right so from here we can calculate what is the average velocity of an electron for the applied potential e so the average velocity of the electron for any applied potential is minus e e tau by n. right so we have seen that if there is an applied electric field the electrons get an average velocity of this particular value now there is no physical intuition for this uh, collision time or relaxation time tau which we will deal later on right so we were trying to understand current conduction in metals and we have to see what happens to the current so how do you estimate current let us consider the same material here right with a lot of electrons with density n that we previously saw right and we have an applied electric field let us say in this particular direction now the current is basically dq by dt right it is if i take a particular cross section here instead of the current we can also consider current density which is much more easier to calculate at this particular time if i take this particular cross se cross section i must have to, i have to see how many electrons cross this particular cross section in unit time t and how i can find that is in time t i just have to count the number of charges which are within this particular a particular length l so that these guys will have the time to cross this particular boundary right and this l is the velocity times the time that we are considering right and all the electrons within this particular l would cross this particular boundary will cross this cross section where we are where we want to calculate so how many electrons are there within this particular cross section is be, is n is equal to this l into the density let's say i am taking this capital n with the small n which is the density that we saw before right so the current or the current density is into time t right is l this l into n into t by t so this l is basically vx into l so with the velocity now we can calculate the current density right so this current density is n n e square tau by m into e the e is the applied uh, field and j is the current density now this is the relation that we are uh, which, which we usually know right so if we take uh, current density by is equal to i by the uh, the cross sectional area and n e square tau by m and e is the potential applied by the length right so we can rewrite this as v equal to l by a m by n e square tau into i and 
and this is a form that we already know right and and in this particular form we know the resistivity rho is m by n e square tau so starting from the roots equation we are able to derive the ohm's law and we have a closed form expression for the resistivity and and this is this is a value which we can compare against things that we have measured at various temperatures let us wait a second here to understand this right so the resistivity is proportional to the mass of the electron right which is approximately constant because we have assumed it to be an ideal gas n is the number of electronic density per centimeter cube and it is inversely proportional to the scattering time so this means that the larger that the electron goes without being the larger distance that the electron goes without being scattered lower is the uh, is the resistivity this is this is obvious right so basically if we, if we go back to this force equation that we saw basically this tells us that as tau is uh, is large as tau is large so basically the momentum at which this can change is going to be uh, large so it can reach to more higher and higher momentum leading to higher and higher velocities and hence lower and lower resistivity right so what drew did was he took some experimental values of um, of resist of resistivity at, at say at room temperature and then he found that this tau for normal metals at room temperature turned out to be about 10 to the power minus 14 seconds right and with this with the he was he assumed the velocity right from the ideal gas that we previously saw so basically you know the velocity from the energy is equal to 3 by 2 kbt so this is the equipartition theorem and if we put this so he found that the scattering length let us say lt here he found it to be about 1 to 10 angstroms and this was the size of the atom in most places so he said that the electrons scatter at ion cores and this was the most uh, dominant thought till more experimental facts at low temperatures started to emerge so there now i would like to take your attention to a certain aspect of this drood model so let us go back to this particular table which is of interest right so this is the uh, measured resistivity and the density for several materials at 273 kelvin right so these are things that we all we all know about lithium is uh, is an elect is, is is a metal with a valence one copper with one or two so it has density something of this sort and you can see how the resistivity changes right so the resistivity of uh, so okay so this so, so basically these are the measured resistivity right so the resistivity of lithium is about 8.55 copper is about 1.56 and silver and gold uh, are about 1. Uh, 1.51 and 2.04 now you know why copper and uh, silver are very good uh, uh, metals for electrical conduction now there is an anomaly here right let's let us take this particular uh, material called beryllium right it has a density of 24.7 at least like six times or three times the density electronic density of um, of copper However, the, uh, the, the the resistivity is not so high; it's only twice. Now, this is the reason behind this is because of this relaxation time, which follows, which which for beryllium was found to be about 0.51 to the power minus 14, whereas for copper it is 2.7. Right. So the experimental values for the relaxation time and the resistivity was something which was not well understood during Drude's period right and the Drude did not able or, or Drude was not able to explain why the relaxation time for different materials were different 
so the physical intuition behind the relaxation time was sort of make missing in the roots model uh, previously described problem with the intuition into the scattering time Drude's model also had difficulty in explaining the temperature dependence of resistivity in metals. So given here are two plots of metal resistivity at various temperatures. It can be seen that at certain temperature ranges the resistivity drops linearly with temperature and at very low temperatures there is some kind of a saturation effect. The saturation in resistivity as temperature changes is also seen at very high temperatures. Here, right? So basically these are the two things which the Drude model does not fully explain. In the Drude's model we know that the kinetic energy of the electron is treated to be uh, from the temperature right so basically from the equipartition theorem you have T as a temperature and hence as the temperature drops the velocity should also equally drop and we know from our uh, root derivation that the as the velocity drops the scattering time the relaxation time also drops and the relaxation time goes inversely with resistivity therefore as temperature drops the resistivity should actually increase but that's not what we see right so basically these are the downsides from the Drude's model so now let us see how the Drude's model help in understanding of the Hall effect and uh, and and its most important observations right so in 1879 uh, hall identified that if i take a piece of a metal i need to draw this in three dimension because uh, hall has this uh, property so if i have something like this i apply an electric field on the x y so let us say This is x, this is y, and this is z. So I apply an electric field ex in the x direction. I have a current ix here. Right? And I have a magnetic field in the z direction. H. You see. Right? So when I have something like this, the observation is that the the magnetic field the hz does not affect what is called as the magneto resistance ex by ix called the magneto resistance right? it, the hz does not affect magneto resistance however there is this hall voltage was found to be proportional to the current ix and the magnetic field so these were experimental facts so the question or what we're trying to address now is how the drude's model help us to understand these particular observations right. so for this let's go back to the force the electron so basically again there are a lot of electrons here right The force experienced by these electrons due to the electromagnetic force, electrical and magnetic force. So do we, let's recall the force that we saw before. So basically this force is called as the Lorentz force and is equal to E E plus E V cross H, right, where V is the electronic velocity. But we saw that this is in the material which undergoes all sorts of collisions and, uh, uh, and the scattering as we saw before. So the total force, so this is this force Lorentz. The total force is minus E E minus E V cross H minus P by tau. Right? This is something that we saw from the Drude's uh, model and because again in steady state this particular uh, force does not cause any additional acceleration of the electrons we assume this to be zero right and because this involves all sorts of three dimensions right so we need to take into account that uh, 
the electrons are let us say are moving only in x y plane so let us calculate this particular thing in all the three dimensions right so basically this will be minus e e x e y minus e so this we know how to calculate the right does it make sense so what I do now is because everything is in momentum space let us change things ex ey minus e by m so this i can write as let us say so not v sorry py h right minus p x h is it right sorry minus 1 by tau px py so this I can write as two different equations 0 is equal to minus e ex minus I define a quantity called omega c where omega c is equal to e h by m so we know that now i take this and i multiply this particular equation by minus n e tau by m multiply the equations both sides right so when I do this I get sigma naught dx because any square tau by m is sigma jy plus jx right so omega c any square any py by m is is j right the same thing comes to the other side minus omega c tau jx plus jy right now in the previous description of this one there is only one current component and there is no current component on the on the y-axis so basically if I have a current like this I y equal to 0 right so this makes this I y equal to 0 so this gives me this uh, this first equation gives me uh, e x by jx is 1 by sigma naught which is a constant which is the magneto resistance yes. right. and if i put jy equal to 0 in the second equation now i get uh, 
e y is equal to minus omega c tau by sigma naught j x from here if we replace uh, sigma naught from the root value we can get the expression minus h by n e into j x now this e y we previously defined as uh, hall potential and we see that the hall potential is proportional to the magnetic field h the carrier density n and the current density jx now if we define a quantity like hall coefficient is equal to ey by h um, jx will be minus 1 by n so here you can see that ey is the hall potential which can be experimentally measured h is the applied magnetic field and jx is the current density that is the uh, x directional current density all these things can be independently measured then you have a quantity called minus 1 by re it is called the hall coefficient and it depends only on the current density or the charge density n so basically this can be an independent measure of the charge in the electrical configuration that you have so this was experimentally found out so this is the major consequence of uh, uh, the Drude model and its uh, explanation for the hall potential and it showed that if you can measure this uh, hall coefficient you can determine the type of the charge that the material has and people have experimentally verified this RH against several materials and they have found very good match for certain materials and poor match for the other. So the reason for the poor match, poor experimental match from the theory, from the Drude model is basically because of the fact that Drude assumed for one that the electron problems with Drude. Okay. Electron was essentially free. The second problem was about the scattering time. The third was the velocity. From the equipartition. was found to be several orders smaller than the experimental velocity and the fourth and the most important is the scattering length of the dude model which we found to be about 1 to 10 angstroms at room temperature right is is very small and even smaller than experimental values at very low temperature what we mean is the scattering length at low temperatures from the root model comes to be at the max about uh, one uh, not sorry not one no, about uh, thousand angstroms but experimentally even scattering lengths of about one centimeter have been observed so all these things lead us to believe that the root model does not show the real picture and you require more sophisticated models something to involve the quantum nature of the electron and 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 
more information regarding the substrate in which the electron resides so all these things we will uh, we will handle the next time we meet so thank you so much we'll stop here